Hi, and welcome to Journey Forward with Jory Rose, where you will gain insights, tools, and inspiration to get unstuck and live your best life. Jory is a licensed marriage and family therapist with a passion for helping people cultivate awareness and authenticity so they can show up fully in all aspects of their life. And now, here's Jory. Hi, and welcome back to Journey Forward with Jory Rose. I'm so looking forward to my conversation today with Kelsey Abbott. Kelsey, thank you so much for coming on. Please tell our listeners about yourself. I'm so excited to be here, Jory. Thank you so much. Of course. So I'm a confidence coach, a certified professional coach, an instigator of joy, and host of the Find Your Awesome podcast. That's all like the labels. Now let's get to the real stuff. Right. So who are you really? But instigator of joy. I love that that's part of your description in, in one of those labels. So tell us more. What does that even mean? I believe joy is our natural state. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we're all born in joy and then we forget about it. Yes. And we forget that we are joy. We forget that joy is right there for us to access. We forget that Joy is there for us to follow every second of every day. We forget that we can hold joy and like the most painful grief and anger all at the same time. We just forget about our joy. So how did you come to realizing that joy was what we need to hold that space for? Mm, That is an amazing question that I've never thought about. Wow. I think this is the therapist and me coming out. (laughs) Well, it won't be a therapy session. (laughs) No, no, that would be amazing. (laughs) Or maybe you just got a free therapy session. Maybe that's what we do. I know. Maybe Maybe that should be a whole new spin on the Journey Forward podcast. Sign up for a (laughs) free therapy session with Drew Rose. You're going to have people just knocking down your door. So, so back, back to that, I, I love that you hadn't ever thought about that. So give yourself some space to think about what was it that made you realize that was your path. I remember early on, like, so this has been the repeating theme throughout my life. Try, kind of trying to be normal, realizing that I'm not like other people and reaching some sort of you know, <clears throat> excuse me, some sort of obstacle, some sort of place where I was like, this is frustrating. I just want to do it the way everyone else is doing it. They're all following these directions. They're all following like the way you're mm-hmm. supposed to do it. I want to do it their way. And I would last like, I don't think I ever even lasted 12 hours doing that. Mm-hmm. It was inauthentic go- for you. Right. So I'd go back to doing it my way, which was like, you know, all bouncing, zigging and zagging and bouncing all over the place. But you know what? And there was so much joy in it. For me, I feel joy in my body and it feels like bubbles. It feels really good. Yeah. And that's what I want. And yeah, it just was more and more time of like, it, it just realizing like, I get to have this. I never believed that I couldn't have joy. But people around me would start being like, wait, what? You just do what feels good. And I was like, Yeah. I just do it feels good. And then gradually those people that didn't really like support that, they just fell out of my life. Right. They didn't align with you. Yeah, they didn't fit in. So it really seems that one of the ways you got there was by figuring out, I, I can let go of all the shoulds and the expectations of who either I think I'm supposed to be or who others expect me to be. And just let go of those stories. Yeah. And I feel right now, I'm so grateful that I learned those lessons really early. How old would you say? Again and again and again. When would you say you you started to learn those? How old were you? Like elementary school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's when I learned that I didn't fit in and that like, okay, this is the way you're supposed to do it, but this is not the way I do it. I remember um, I had a tutor in first grade and one of the reasons they wanted to tutor me was because I drew my O's backwards. And I remember at that <laughs> moment be like, no, I draw my O's the way I want to draw my O's. You know, I love that you said that because it seems like such a, a silly thing to want to want to correct. And yet they were trying to take away your individuality. Yes. My daughter is turning 16 next month. And so you'll appreciate this. She draws her S's from the bottom up 
and she writes her T's with the short line across and then goes down. I love it. So she's right there with you and no one is, you know, telling her you're drawing your letters wrong because they all look the same when they're done. <laughs> exactly. I still do my, to this day when I see somebody like very obviously writing an O, I watch them because I'm like, I still don't know which way is the right way. That's so funny. <laughs> That's too no. funny. So you had this awareness at a young age. Mm -hmm. And felt, and I think girls have this a lot more and boys have it in a different way. I used to be a school counselor. So I used to work with a lot of a re relational aggression in girls and how that shows up in the form of the mean girl attitude and the bossiness and the eye rolls and the sneers and you're my best friend one day and then I'm going to be a bitch to you the next day. Yeah, I think there's a lot more in girls because I think girls have that bigger fear of fitting in. Oh, absolutely. The other part of, so I was tutored for, I think all of first grade. And then at the end of first grade, I asked my parents to stop it because I got pulled out of class and that meant that I was called a stupid kid. Mm. And so there was a label being put on you. Mm -hmm. Well, there's more to that story, but I knew I was like, I don't want that. I want to be friends. I want to be like one of the kids. And I, I still, I'm like, I'm really proud of six-year-old me. I'm like, go a little Kelsey. Yeah. Way to stand up for yourself. Like, you're so brave. But let's back up. So my first grade class was broken into the panda bears and the unicorns. And we were not supposed to know that one, kid, one group was a smart group. And one group <laughs> was a not so smart group. But this panda bear knew <laughs> that uh -huh. the unicorns are all wicked sparkly. And the panda bears are cute and roly-poly. <laughs> Yeah, so I picked up on that pretty quickly, and that's where... Can we be a, a, a wicked, sparkly, roly-poly? Exactly. Well, actually, well, yes, because <laughs> if, if you want to Google right now, there is such thing as a panda corn. I'm totally doing that when we're done with this call. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I choose to be. I, I never craved perfection, but I was well aware that, like, yeah, all my friends were in the unicorn group mm. when I was a panda bear. And then we were all supposed to read in front of the class. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that proved, but we were all supposed to read in front of the class. And I was the last kid to go, the last panda bear. And I read a dog on a log. Mm -hmm. And then everyone clapped at the end. And I somehow already internalized that as a pity clap. Mm -hmm. At six years old, I knew what a pity clap was. I mean, I don't Kelsey, think you I were super self-aware for such a young age. And I love how these stories stuck with you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. They got deeply wired and rooted in there, huh? Yep. Oh, I can still picture the cover of a dog on a log that I read out loud. Um, <clears throat> I can still picture the classroom. I can picture it all. That's my earliest memory of my inner critic. Mm. Of saying you're not good enough because mm -hmm. you're not good enough to be a unicorn. And then you're not good enough because you're like the last kid to read. Mm -hmm. You're not good enough because you got a pity clap. Yeah, so, that's so there like, was layers in that. Oh, yeah. And then that inner critic holds on to that story. And then it becomes, you know, looking for it's that confirmation bias where the inner critic will try to look for evidence to support that belief. Oh, Yeah. Oh yeah. And I, another memory of that was in college as a swimmer and I used to swim, I was a sprinter. So some of the 50 free, this is an event that would take like, you know, less than 25 seconds. Mm -hmm. And I have such clear memory of one particular race pushing off the wall at the turn of the 25 yard mark and noticing that I was ahead and kind of logging that. And then coming into the flags with five yards left to go in the race and realizing I was still ahead and backing off just a teeny, teeny, tiny bit. So mm -hmm. I touched in second because I didn't believe I was good enough. Wow. Yeah. So is this self-sabotage? Oh, yeah. You know, I see this a lot in clients and in clients of colleagues of mine where there is a fear of success. And the self-sabotage 
you know, when it happens and you ask the question of why did you do that or how did that serve you, it's sometimes hard to find the answer. But I think behind the either lack of self-worth is a fear of, well, if I succeed in this, then I should be able to succeed in other things. And what if I can't live up to that expectation I now have on myself? So if I, you know, don't win the race, then I at least am back in my alignment with what my inner critic believes I am. Yeah, I can still be a panda bear. Because mm-hmm. I don't, unicorns win races. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Panda bears don't, can't swim. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, I, I love, I mean, my branding is so spot on for my belief system and in the work that I do, there's a journey forward. And because I think people get stuck, right? And so I often ask people, how's it serving you to stay stuck? And they often are like, it's not, it's not serving me at all. This sucks. I hate this. My inner critic's so loud, blah, blah, blah. But being stuck gives an identity. Yeah, it does. It's familiar. They know how to do it. Even if we don't like it, we know what to do with it. So you knew what to do being a panda, even though you really wanted to be a unicorn. Then when the unicorn was like, here I am, you're like, no, wait, but I'm still a panda. I was like, but I'm not sparkly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So fast forward to where you are now, to being a coach of the instigator of joy. How did you overcome that story that you believed from such a young age that was so pervasive in, it sounds like in many areas of your life. Yeah, it showed up everywhere. It was in coaching school when we started looking at our inner critic. What is it? What is the, what does your inner critic say to you? And it was so clear, you're not worthy. Mm. Um, And then I do this exercise that I do with my clients where you transform your inner critic. You can turn it into anything you want. Mine. Could could you walk us through a little bit of that and tell us more about what yours was? Absolutely. Okay. So we do it as a visualization and there are some funny pieces to this in that your inner critic seems to care a whole lot about what it's wearing Mm -hmm. and what it's going to wear in its promotion. So what you do is you're going to figure out what do you really want your inner critic to be? Do you want it to be your cheerleader, your coach, um, your best friend, your personal superhero? The options are endless. And then we get through what is it going to wear <laughs> because, because inner critics often just stop there. So we have the person, you have a meeting with your inner critic and you thank them so much for their service because they've been protecting you. Yes. Because when my inner critic was telling me I'm not worthy, that made it less scary when somebody else told me I'm not worthy, mm-hmm. which may or may not have ever happened. Right. But that was the fear, right? I was protecting right. myself. Whether it, the story is I'm not worthy or I'm fat or I'm too slow or I'm not smart enough, then if somebody else tells you that, the idea is you're safe. It's cool. I already knew that. Yeah. So you figure out what you want your inner critic to be, how you want it to show up, and you describe the whole thing and you have you basically pitched the idea to your inner critic. And then... You get to choose what it is. The two of you work together to choose what it is. My inner critic is, it's a superhero. He's like a toddler. He's kind of like Cupid. He's Uh like a little toddler. He wears a cape and he flies. (laughs) And he doesn't hang around with me that much anymore. But right when I transformed him, he was there all the time. Mm -hmm. All the time. And so joy became the thing that you wanted to serve most, not the critic. Yeah. That critic was like stale. Mm-hmm. You know, when I, when I felt it so clearly, I was like, oh, you have been sticking around for so many years. And you're like, you know, I don't still have the clothes I wore in first grade. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't fit into those. And they'd be right. way out of style. So why am I still carrying this around? Yeah. Warm. You know, I I love that. And and I'm going to use that in addition to some other tools I use with clients around inner critic, because I think people get so fearful of interacting with the inner critic because it's just a big, bad bully. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just led a a women's retreat uh, last week. And one of the whole focus on the retreat was on self-compassion. And one of the exercises is adapted from Krista Neff's work on self-compassion, which is an exercise in interacting with your inner critic. And it's to look at a behavior we wish 
we wish to change and through the way that we change it is often through criticism like yeah. you know if you only push harder you are smarter you are faster you are whatever it is and then tune into the piece of you that feels criticized so now you've got like this I and this me right you've got this voice in your head and then there's the you who feels and so tune into the piece of where you feel criticized and then send that piece of you compassion and then have curiosity of what was behind the inner critics intentions. Just like you said, it's there to protect you in some way. It's just, it's delivery sucks. Yeah. It's, well, it's like voice. you're probably it's so mean. protecting you. Yeah. And so then to be able to have the reframe of, wow, you mean my inner critic is actually on my side? It's, they just have like the worst delivery ever. <laughs> yeah, they're just really socially awkward. Yes, they don't know. Yeah, they don't know how to communicate. They don't know how to speak kindly. And so then to replace the message that the inner critic gives with one of self-compassion or kindness or, you know, in your case, joy, whatever it is. And it's beautiful. I've seen such beautiful turnarounds for people. Yeah. And well, I, I totally sharing. am going to add on of like, you know, what's your inner critic wearing? I love that. I have to figure out what my inner critic wears. Mine wasn't that exciting, but I've had clients be like, uh, hold on. So one client had her gremlin, like her inner critic was, is very, um, uptight, like boss lady, I think is how she described it. We're a very perfect suit and perfect makeup, hair curled under the pearls, the, you know, absolutely. I have an image. Yeah. And she was like, so she wants to know if she can wear a boa. <laughs> I was like, awesome. What else? I'm pretty sure she was de decked out in like boots and a leopard print mini skirt and this pink boa and just this. She's hair. rocking it now. Yeah, total rock star. See, I think my inner critic is wearing um, really awesome skinny jeans and is like, haha, you can't fit into these. <laughs> Oh, that's what I just came to like my inner critic. It usually shows up in the form of body image issues. Mm -hmm. And so I think my inner critic is wearing like the best jeans ever and just taunting me walking around. What a jerk. Yeah. She's a total bitch. <laughs> yeah. It's like damn her like and her perfect jeans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and now when you do coaching with your clients, and so you said something in the beginning that I want to go back to because I, I see this a lot as well, but I'm curious in how you interact with it when people have been dealt a really shitty hard hand in life and they're like, Kelsey, I don't have joy. Joy isn't meant for me, right? They think that they're somehow faded differently or they've tried to bring it in and they just haven't been successful with it. How do you interact with having either a new language or a reframe or um, a redefinition of what that could look like for people? Because so many people have really, really, really hard lives. Yeah. Well, so obviously we acknowledge and validate. Of course. And then it, when people are out of touch with joy, they tend to think of joy as this really big thing. Mm -hmm. But joy can be super tiny. Like cutting open a perfect avocado oh my god best joy ever <laughs> exactly the universe is in perfect alignment when that happens uh-huh so do you have access to that right now do you have access to going to get yourself an avocado or the perfect banana or it doesn't have to but be then i can just food. imagine the person being like but kelsey i never get the perfect avocado i know, I know. my banana always has bruises <laughs> so then what i challenge them to is I have two ways of presenting it. One is, I guess this is my go-to, inconspicuous awesomeness. Inconspicuous awesomeness. Okay, tell me more. So, and I did this as an Instagram project for two or three years. Um, find the inconspicuous awesomeness today. What is it? It's, you're, you get to wake up first thing in the morning and all day long, you've got a scavenger hunt. Mm. You get to find the inconspicuous awesomeness of the day. Maybe it was like a perfect leaf on the ground or a flower or the smell of fresh, fresh cut grass oh, or the sound of a bird singing. Maybe it was uh, your favorite song on the radio. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was that you didn't have to wear pants today. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you were wearing something other than pants, but maybe yeah. not. <laughs> exactly. Maybe you just got to wear what you want. Maybe you had to sleep an extra 10 minutes. 
maybe your puppy woke you up and it was like the sweetest way to wake up ever. Mm -hmm. But I really, I don't think like you can have the hardest life ever. Yeah. And there's still, there's something tiny that you can find. And then it's a practice. It's a practice to look for it. And and we know with our negativity bias, the more we focus on the negative, the bigger the negative becomes. And the more we look for the joy, the more we find it. Um, It's so funny, but I'm a very visual person. And as soon as you said the inconspicuous awesomeness and to look, you know, have that scavenger hunt throughout the day, the first image that came to my mind was a fairy like Tinkerbell. Mm-hmm. And like Tink and I love Tinkerbell. I love her sassiness and I love like her sparkle. And there was a point in my life where she was like my spirit animal. <laughs> I was gonna say that I see that very clearly. <laughs> I even cut my hair really short for a couple years. Um so I had to embody my Tinkerbell energy. Uh, in fact, totally little sidebar. I even had a bumper sticker of her on the back of my car, which I've never been able to find after I got rid of that car. But she was like leaning over behind her. So it was her from behind and she was leaning over behind her, blowing a kiss. But then there was a little heart on her butt and it was essentially a kiss my ass. I love but it. It was on Tinkerbell, so it came across all cute. Anyhow, when you said inconspicuous awesomeness, I had this image of just like Tinkerbell floating around and like leaving her little pixie dust. Be like, oh, look here. Oh, wait, wait, look over here. Wait, no, no, wait, look, you know, and if you don't catch the glimmer of Tinkerbell, if I don't catch the glimmer of Tinkerbell, then I might miss it. Mm -hmm. Or see it as a stupid distraction rather than a pathway to my awesomeness for the day. Or just take it for granted. Yeah. Like for some people, it's like, you know, my first sip of coffee was amazing. Mm-hmm. But do, yesterday morning, did you even pay attention to the taste of your coffee or the feel yeah. of that warm mug in your hands? I feel like an yeah. imposter, actually. I got to admit, I don't drink coffee, but so many people but do. People do, and they love it. Yes. Well, and so, I mean, to me, that would really just be a practice in awareness. Mm-hmm. I think that's Which where I think awareness is the root to everything. Without awareness, then we just keep spinning. Yeah. And with awareness, we realize that, well, like, we only one inconspicuous awesomeness, but there were so many. You know, it was that flower. No, it was my time in the woods with my dog. No, it was actually that call with a client. No, mm-hmm. it was dinner with my husband. Like, yeah, oh, look at that. So much awesomeness in your life. Yeah. So how do you help people hold on to that? Because I think I know of people who could see it in the moment and then as quickly as they see it, go back to their misery. So one of my favorite exercises is I told you, I feel joy in my body. Mm. I think that to really get, well, get a a feeling, we're going to dig into it. So I asked them, what does joy look like for you? Mm -hmm. What color is it? What does it smell like? What does it sound like? What does it taste like? Mm -hmm. And then they can think of that anytime. So for me, joy smells like jasmine, jasmine Mm -hmm. by the ocean. So I can just think of that smell and it makes me happy. I can think Mm -hmm. of the taste of passion fruit and my mouth is totally (sighs) smiling right now. Oh my gosh. Passion fruit in Thailand was unlike anything else I've ever experienced in my life. Oh, we had it in Costa Rica and it was amazing. You need to go track down some passion fruit in Thailand. So I've had it in Costa Rica too. It's like a different species of passion fruit. Oh, really? So I might oh, not yeah. ever come back? You might not. Because I have to eat passion fruit nonstop. <laughs> passion fruit. We even had um, bartenders in Thailand make us a fresh passion fruit martini. Oh. Like literally just cut it open and shake it. And oh, passion fruit. I might, I'm salivating right now. Yeah. So it sounds like that might be your joy to too. Thailand. Yeah. <laughs> and passion fruit sorbet. That's oh my gosh. So amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, so I love how you're using the senses to embody it because I think when we get into a sensory experience, it gets embedded or imprinted in a different way. It's not just so cognitive. Exactly. And our brains, I mean, our brains are what came up with the inner critic. Do you want to trust them? Right. Like, let's get into our bodies. What does it feel like? So for me, it feels like puppy dog ears. That's joy, that that soft puppy ear. And I have an eight-week-old puppy right now, so I, for the first time, actually know what you mean. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I I love, I love that. And I imagine that's really hard for people to do who are super cerebral. I mean, people live, you know, from the chin up. You know what? 
I thought it was going to be super hard when I started having people do this too. And the people that I'm like, yeah, is this person going to be able to, like, are they ready for this? They dive right in. Do they? Well, probably because at that point they're, they're craving something. Yeah. And you're offering them something tangible that they can hold on to. So it's, it's something that you hold on to and then you build and then you let it grow. And eventually that inner critic doesn't get so loud anymore, huh? Right. That inner critic is, we can remind the inner critic, oh, that's not your job anymore. Mm -hmm. You're not here to protect me anymore. Now we're teammates. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for your service. And you're not needed in that way. Exactly. I still need you to hang out with me. Let's still be friends. And I I love, because every time you say joy, I really picture also the character from the movie Inside Out. And um, I've mentioned this before on the podcast, but I'll say it again because it really seems fitting here. When I met my boyfriend, who's the love of my life, I met him on Tinder almost four years ago. And he's got a PhD in educational psychology. And so like his Tinder profile had two... Um, two things that were like his credentials to say who he who, who he was. One was PhD in educational psychology, and the second was that he consulted on Pixar's Inside Out because he's an expert in emotions. I'm like, oh my god, that's so hot, <laughs> man who's an expert in emotions. But he actually consulted on the character anger because he does anger management. Special, he's a specialty in anger management. And what I love about the movie Inside Out is how scientifically accurate it is as far as mm-hmm. how our brain and our emotions are at the control panel of our brain and how we always think that joy has to be at the forefront, but we need the others there to even know joy can exist. Exactly. And in the movie, sadness is actually the hero of the movie that helps us bring us back to joy. Like unless we embrace all of it, we can't let joy continue to run the panel of our brain. Yeah. Yeah. We got to feel all of them. Yeah. And they and all let have them a move place through us. and they're all necessary mm-hmm. and they're all human. Yes. And it's, we connect through all of them. We so what are some of the humans. other ways with your find your awesomeness? It's just, I, I, I just feel good when I hear you say that. Like I just want to, find my awesomeness all the time. So in addition to looking for the inconspicuous awesomeness, do you have any other tips for people of things that you do to help them embrace the best pieces of themselves or their day or their lives? Mm. So I believe that your awesome is your unique greatness. It is that thing you're born with that again, got covered up by the shoulds, by the, we don't act like that. We don't talk like that. All the well-meaning things that we've been taught throughout our lives. That and eventually shut us down. Exactly. Eventually we're like, I don't know how to behave in public, but I'm not supposed to do that or that or that. And so when we start clearing all that stuff away, we can let our awesome shine. Yeah. So every single human has that spark, that awesome within them. They just have to see it to believe it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it it was interesting. I was working with a a couple the other day and he's really not feeling his awesome. His inner critic is loud and is also being reinforced externally. And I, he was looking down and I actually asked him to pick his head up. So I wanted to make eye contact with him because I wanted him to really not only hear my words, but take it in, in a visual way. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him and I said, I believe in you. And I believe your intentions of wanting to do all these things to improve your life and your relationships. And I know you may not hold the space for it yet. And you may have not had it yet in your life and that you can tangibly hold on to, but I do. Cause if you, you wouldn't be here if you didn't have that intention and desire. And it was so powerful to, I mean, using the language you're using to like kind of hand him his awesomeness yeah, and to reinforce it and say, yeah, it might be hard work for you to carry it on your own. And I can understand why the patterns have externally not supported it, but you're human. And I do believe that potential is within you. Right. And I, I see people's awesome. 
I see it like the second I meet somebody Mm -hmm. and they may not see it. They may not be ready to see it. They may not be ready to step into it. I can hold that space until you get there. I got you. Well, it's scary at times to redefine ourselves. Yeah. It's a totally change what we think is right and what our head is telling us is right and proper and the appropriate way to do things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, within that mindset is so powerful. I mean, I, 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 one of my favorite books right now is the upside of stress. Have you read this book or have you heard of it? Oh, I highly recommend it by Kelly McGonigal. Okay. I remember seeing her Ted talk. Yeah. She's out at Stanford and she's been a stress researcher for years and there's new science and research around stress that basically says stress is only as bad as we think stress is bad for us. Mm. Like how you think about stress affects how stress affects you. It's a brilliant book, but what backs that up is all these mindset studies to prove just the power of our mindset. And if you don't think it's going to get better, basically it won't. But if you do believe it can get better, it will. I think also if you do see the gifts in something right off the bat, Mm -hmm. people might think you're a little bit crazy, but there's so much beauty in just seeing the gift, finding the gift in the, in the stuff that hurts yeah. and the stuff that's a massive bummer. Cause there's always a gift. Yeah. Maybe hard to uncover. You may have mm-hmm. to dig pretty deep, dig pretty deep to find it, but I agree with you. I think it's always there and it's the there for the very least to help us grow. Yeah. I mean, there's, So many beautiful cliches, you know, like the lotus growing in the mud, bread dough only rises in the dark. Like, you know, you can't see the stars, you know, you only see the stars at night. Like they're they're cliches for a reason because they're ubiquitous in their truth. Yeah, because enough people kept coming up with the statements. (laughs) Yes. They needed more cliches to say the same thing. Yes, I love it. So now that your inner critic has grown up and isn't, uh, you know, a mean little Cupid, Mm-hmm. What does your inner awesome look like now? Mm. My superpower is connecting with people. Mm-hmm. It's intuitively connecting. It's deep connection. And I help people remember who they are and why they're here. Mm. So they can find their awesome and step into it and be sparkly as fuck. Yes. That's really why we're all here. That's and our you job. are super sparkly. I wish we were like in the same town and we could just go hang up and hang out and spread, you know, pixie dust around us. I think we would be an awesome pair to just flit around. That would be so fun. You know, I think they make biodegradable glitter now. I would love to just like run around and sprinkle it all over the place. That would be so fun. <laughs> you know, this is like total sidebar, but I think you'll appreciate because of the glitter. One of my biggest joys of being a mom was being the tooth fairy. And I would go totally, because I, I believe in fairies, as I already told mm-hmm. you, like Tinkerbell is my spirit animal and um, or my spirit guide. So when I was the tooth fairy, I would, um, I would leave them notes as, as well as, you know, little gifts and whatever. But I had this jar of pixie dust that I would sprinkle on their face when they were sleeping and sometimes they would feel it and they would like move a little bit. And when they would wake up, they thought the tooth fairy kissed them because they were covered in this sparkle and they wouldn't wash their face that day before going to school because they wanted to like not get rid of the sparkle. And let me just tell you how sad I was when my youngest lost her last tooth. And I'm like, I don't get to sparkle them anymore while they sleep. It truly was one of my absolute biggest joys of being a mom. I so think, maybe you oh. maybe realize I can just maybe bring some pixie dust wherever I go. Also, your puppy's going to lose his teeth. <gasps> I get to be the tooth fairy again for my puppy. Yeah. My puppy Buddha. He's my little Buddha. Like and little baby named him Buddha. <laughs> and there are some of them might be like, they might fall out on the floor and you might step on something and be like, Oh my God, what was that? That was worse than a Lego, but it's okay. Aww. Cause it's a little puppy tooth. I gotta be the tooth fairy again. That's awesome. See, I'm finding more awesome. Thank you for <laughs> pointing that out. <laughs> so and maybe the tooth fairy comes to the whole house. Yeah. Who loses the tooth. I just might, I'm going to go sprinkle out on my kids again. Yeah. So Kelsey, how can people find you if they want to follow you, if they want to work with you, if they want to just know more about what Find Your Awesome is, what would be best ways to connect? 
So the best place, like my home on the internet is KelseyAbbott.com. Okay. You can find me on the Find Your Awesome podcast and come play on Instagram. Like, let's be real. I'm at Kelsey Abbott CPC. That's, okay. that's how you can reach me. That's where we can hang out. I've got a couple things brewing. I don't have sales pages up yet, but there is a retreat coming in January. <sighs> Find Your Flow, and a program leading into Find Your Flow is Shed Your Shit. Oh, I love Shed that. Your shit, find Your Flow. Tell me a little bit more about that retreat. What's that going to be like? It's going to be here in Sarasota. Okay. On Siesta Key in January. There's an eclipse happening that same weekend. It's going to be magical. It's going to be so full of flow, as in we've got ideas of stuff we're going to do, but it is not going to be regimented in any way. Yeah. How long is the retreat? Just a weekend. Oh, that will be amazing. Oh, I wish I was closer. I would totally show up. That would be awesome. Oh my gosh. Well, we'll have to do that sometime. It's funny. I do a workshop in in December right before New Year's called Let Your Shit Go. Oh, it's perfect. Yeah, it is. And we, you know, we set intentions and we burn stuff and we... (laughs) We, we bring in intentions. Um, but it's, I think you're so right is that we have to shed what's holding us back before we can find the light. Yeah. Yeah. you got to make space for the light. It's and there. You just got to realize it's filled. there. Filled. Yeah. Yes. So you can see it. Yes. Well, Kelsey, thank you so much. I have, I, I feel like I could just, I just want to keep hanging out with you. Um, but I will have all of your links in the show notes. So anyone listening will be able to find them and follow Kelsey and um, reach out for any other awesome inquiries that they have with her. And thank you so much. Uh, you've really helped me um, identify my inner critic and helped me realize that Tinkerbell is still here in her awesome, sassy ways, even though I don't always need her like I used to, but of course she's still there. i Thank you for all your kind words. And I really feel like I'm looking at Tinkerbell right now. Oh, thank like, you. Like, I don't think you need her because you are her. Thank you. But better. Well, I'm, 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 it's my inner glow. It's my, I, think, I really feel inclined to go put some pixie dust on myself right now. <laughs> I, I support that. I knew you would. I knew you would. Thank you for not judging. And <laughs> no, no. Well, I am positively judging. I confess. Okay, perfect. And All right. Like the best well, Kelsey, ever. think, and I'd have to say one last thing is I, when, so you talked about being six, when I was six, um, there were two girls in, in my first grade class and they were best friends and their names were Kelsey and Cami. And I always loved both of the names and my daughter's name is Cami. So I can't tell cause I, that's how, how I got the name was from this awesome girl in kindergarten and first grade who I just, I loved her name. But when I, every time I say your name, I, I'm like my six year old self thinking Kelsey and Cammie. Oh, so cool. I'm like being brought back to my young self. So I just thought I would share because of your six year old story that brought up like a, a positive six year old story of my own of how I got to my daughter's name. <laughs> That's awesome. And Kelsey is more common now than it used to be. Yeah. It used to to be very rare and got butchered a lot. Yeah. Well, it's, it's more of your uniqueness. So it is, it actually means an independent Island. Really? Or a unique Harbor. And there's a bunch of different meanings that are, they're all like unique and independent. Well, there you go. You are being given that moniker for a reason. Exactly. You were born. All right, Kelsey. Well, thank you so much. And I look forward to continuing to spread the awesomeness throughout my day and the rest of the weekend. And I'm sure once the listeners hear this, it'll just continue to sparkle everywhere. So thank you. Thank you, Jory. This is great. To continue your journey forward, find Jory Rose on Facebook and Instagram to become part of her growing community. You can also gain access to her meditations, books, online classes, or to sign up for an upcoming retreat, visit her at joryrose.com. That's J-O-R-E-E-R-O-S-E dot com.